Today is the 10th of March 2021 and in a local newspaper, The Echo, uh, an article was published by Aslan Shand. Locals not happy with 37 million multiple occupancy proposal near Ukai. This is a wonderful article and I'm going to read it. It's a development application, DA, for 750 to 1,500 people in 392 houses over 1,584 hectares at an estimated cost of 37 million near Ukai, stretching from Mount Burrell and Kunga again. And they stayed again then because uh, across the road is actually Mebbin Springs development that does actually have DA approval for 70 lots, I believe. So that's the reference to again in case anyone doesn't know. Under the DA, the land will be subdivided into 10 rural land sharing communities, alternatively known as multiple occupancies, and one village parcel. Heading Public Meeting. Locals aren't happy and they are calling a, meet a meeting this Sunday, 14th of March 2021, at the Ukai Hall from 12 till 3 pm to discuss the DA. Tweed Mayor Chris Sherry and Councillor Katie Milne will be there and Lismore MP Janelle Saffin and Ronnie Sasanto have also been invited to attend. According to Northern Rivers Guardians, the proponents, those putting forward the DA, were earlier involved in a similar venture known as Bulla Bulla, a failed intentional community that left many investors out of pocket when it collapsed. Another heading, no more MOs or multiple occupancies. Last week, Tweedshire Council sought to put the final nail in the coffin of rural land sharing communities in the Tweedshire by passing a notion, a motion to remove Tweedshire from the state planning SEPP that allowed rural land sharing communities to be created in Tweedshire. Multiple occupancies had already been removed from the Tweed Local Environmental Plan, LEP 2000, and the Tweed Local Environmental Plan, LEP 2014. However, as this DA has already been submitted, it may be judged under the existing SEPP. Now, next heading, deforestation. Objectors to the DA say that there are numerous issues with the proposal. They say the DA is seeking to relocate and reduce to a quarter of its size a critical wildlife corridor. The DA claims that no koalas inhabit the area and that no other endangered or threatened species are present on the site, neither of which is true. In fact, the major wildlife corridor that runs through the site connects Mebane National Park with Nightcap National Park, and 48 threatened fauna species have been recorded on the site, as the DA acknowledges, Appendix E2, page 38, said the NRG, or National Rivers Guardians um, representative, in their assessment of the DA. The fact that the development will ultimately be larger than the nearby town of Ukai has also raised a range of concerns for locals. This is centred around the impact of traffic in the area that will degrade and create congestion on local roads. Next heading, sewerage and water. They also highlight that the, D the DA proposes each house maintain its own sewerage and waste treatment as well as potable drinking water supplies. We note that Ukai has its own wastewater treatment plant operated by Tweed Shire Council that services approximately 800 people, says National Rivers Guardians. 
They highlight that the impact of managing sewerage and potable water for 750 to 1500 people should be considered a major infrastructure issue and not left up, not left up to individual households. While the DA says that water will be mainly harvested on rainwater off roofs, it also notes the opportunity for bores and springs also identified as available to the site, raising concerns over the potential long-term impacts of the area's water supply and man management. And the final heading is comment on DA. The DA is currently on exhibition and will be assessed by the Tweed Shire Council. However, the decision on approval will be made by the regional, the Northern Regional Planning Panel, or the NRPP, as the estimated cost of the DA is 37 million. The community can make submissions on the DA until midnight, Wednesday, the 24th of March. If more than 10 objections are received, the Nor Northern Regional Planning Panel will hold public hearings, which will give the community an opportunity to voice their concerns in person, says the Northern Rivers Guardians. Now, this is wonderful that this kind of um, exposure is now starting to come out uh, in the media, in community newspapers, so that other people in the broader community can actually start paying attention to what's been going on here. And uh, it has been going on for some time. As was stated in the article, these current developers, both Adrian Brannock and Mark McMurtry, were involved with the failed Buller Buller, as was Derek Zillman and Richard Moat and Philip Dixon and Sheree Stokes and Peter Van Lyshout in the way that they have brought him in under contract to take uh, take um, to buy his lands that he was already involved with the Buller Buller community before it collapsed and contracts were said to have already been made back in 2016. So ultimately all the people, the major players that are involved with this current development application have just set up a bigger expansive project than Buller Buller was originally. It failed so they're now taking back those lands where Buller Buller was and expanding the concept out and in every definition they are actually trying to say that it's not the same people but I'm not going to bring up the evidence that is out there from Mark McMurtry's own mouth in his own promotional video to encourage investors to buy in I will make that a subject of another video so that um, these things can be highlighted there I think the important thing for people now is to remember that the deadline is the 24th of March for any public submissions. If you want to have your say on this development, it has to be in by then. If you are having a hard time trying to word it out and thinking now oh, there's too many things, well, you can actually do one at a time. The Northern Regional Planning Panel, if you go to their website and look at how they tell you to submit, they actually say that you can submit more than once. So you don't have to write um, a submission that contains everything in it. You can submit multiple times on different issues. So you can also go along this Sunday at the Ukai Hall, Sunday the 14th of March, there will be a lot of community attendance and support. And show up, show your support. And if you're having trouble finding the words to put into a, 
a submission. There will be plenty of suggestions and any help that you need from your fellow community members. And you should also remember that there will be representatives from the council on Sunday, the Mayor, Chris Sherry and Councillor Katie Milne. These two people are showing up and they are going to be available to ask questions of too. And I dare say that as members of the community, they are likewise concerned about this. I mean, these are the same council people that have actually voted to remove rural land sharing communities. So when the mayor and councillor show up on Sunday, welcome them and also tell them that we will be there to support them when they put forward their proposal to remove rural land sharing communities from the SEPP so that anything like this proposal can never happen again. And I think that there are only five comments at this stage, but I dare say it's early days yet and there will be a lot of people commenting. So I do recommend to go along and add your comments. One of them down here, let me read them. Kyogle Road is already a death trap due to the unrestrained sale and mishandling of giant four-wheel drives that are too big for those driving them and the width of most roads. Coupled with middle-class entitlement and arrogant disregard for the environment, you get overdevelopment, loss of habitat and a demographic shift resulting an influx, resulting an influx of liberal voting numbskulls. Now actually these comments are politically mo motivated and they are having a dig at liberals so but the points are v valid whether they're calling them liberals or not. These are very valid points in the community. And Jeff Dorset actually replied to Paul Saxby's comment and said absolutely Paul you are spot on. The crink criminal ecocidal sociopaths who are responsible for drafting this stupid insidious destructive plan to destroy overpopulate our environment our fauna and flora the ancient fragile biodiversity our community our way of life our future are indulging in nothing less than corrupt new south um, new south wales yeah, Liberal National Party or whatever government controlled fascist style social, social engineering of the North Coast electorates to fill them up with mindless get rich quick bourgeois migrants and, insp and aspirational consumerism obsessed families. Wow, well, some people talk in mouthfuls, don't they? <laughs> it's hard to say it all. Consumers to displace the traditional left voting Anglo working class, hippies, counter culture, ferals, greens, leftists, as rents and house prices skyrocket from rapidly increasing demand and real estate speculation greed. Actually that skyrocketing rent and house prices and real because of real estate speculation greed that's all over Australia and I dare say in so many places in the world. Real estate agents are driving too many prices up. They, even when you're renting, you're not supposed to be paying a percentage of the fee that a, a landlord pays an agent, but the agent will build in the cost of the landlord's fee into your rent. And they keep pushing it up and pushing it up. And every time a law is changed, because there was a law that came in that said that you can put your rents up every year by $5 or whatever, that's exactly what a lot of real estate agents started to do. Put their rents up every year by $5. Well, hey, no, we're not going to go $5. We'll kick these ones out because there's a bigger demand. And I know people are desperate. 
I'm going to ask an extra $50. And up and up and up, these real estate agents push the prices so that nobody can afford to live in homes anymore or to buy them, to rent them in any way, shape or form. It is a greedy, capitalistic market. And one now that the development is real estate at Nightcap on Minjimbul. It is just another greedy real estate grab. And those trying to make profit out of it that have already shown that they have failed in their last attempt. Now we'll encourage people to go and have a comment here. I don't know if you have to sign up or anything to actually leave a reply. I dare say you do. Or maybe you can just put in a name and they will take the reply as a public comment. I don't know. But the more comments that are left here under this article, the more there is actually available in the resources for the future and showing the general um, public opinion. And I say that because when you're looking at things to do with Nightcap on Minjimbul that do go back <laughs> so many years, that you are actually grateful even for the small comments that people make and what they say because that in itself can give valuable information that um, may be skimmed over in major articles. And the good thing about people's comments too is that they are real. These are real comments. These are not someone that's trying to, you know, <laughs> win fans and get uh, subscribers or anything. These are people with genuine emotions. They feel things and they are impassioned to write what they think and good on them I think more people should do that and I will encourage I will leave a link for this website so that you can um, this article so that you can go and leave a reply and a big thank you to Aslan Shan from the Echo thank you very much for bringing this to the public's attention this has this issue has been ongoing for many years, as I'm sure that uh, locals have actually informed you of. But it is also something that does need to come to an end sooner or later. And it's an end that nobody wants this proposal to go through. The locals are opposed to it. Even the council is opposed to it. If the council was supportive of it, they wouldn't be moving to remove rural land sharing communities in the Shire. It's that simple. I mean, they already have removed them from the Shire. This development application is, well, if you look at council's position on how they're actually still under the SEPP, they shouldn't actually be under it. So in the, if you look at, as I said, how council have described how they've ended up been put in the SEPP when they were told that they would not be transferred to another vessel or um, you know act that was covering them and then they were just put in there and they didn't know it and now now they have to abide by it because they've been stuck in there and this was actually contrary to several years worth of communications with the relevant departments to ensure that that didn't actually happen, that they weren't going to be put in the SEPP. So now it's a matter of removing themselves when really they shouldn't have even been put in there. And this is the advice that they were given from government departments that they would not be transferred to that vehicle or the, the state legislation that is now making them have to consider this development application. Now I'd also like to highlight that the $37 million that's actually the projected civil construction costs is if you take out, I've shown in previous videos where there is the expense of the water tanks that owner builders have to put in when they buy in 
and the sewerage treatment plant they also have to put in. Now it's clearly specified in the documents lodged with the, de the development application that these two costs specifically will not be met by the development. They are not civil construction costs. They are individual homeowner costs. So when you total those costs together, just those two, which are actually padded in non-civil construction costs, that equals 7.2 million. Now, I have not confirmed that 30 million is the tip over point for when it goes to the Northern Regional Planning Panel. But if you take out just the two known ones that are clearly specified and are not civil construction costs, the project is now under 30 million and it does not meet the requirements to even make it to be considered by the Northern Regional Planning Panel. So by my estimates, this development application has submitted false costings. And if you take out what shouldn't be in there, what is not civil, um, civil construction costs of the development, it is well under 30 million. In fact, 21 million. Now, I might suggest here that if you took 21 million and maybe what three bridge upgrades might cost, I would suggest that perhaps that wouldn't come to 30 million. So, you find someone that can say, well, we don't need to do bridge upgrades, we can just go do this, and then we can take the bridge upgrades out, and we can add in owner-builder costs, non-civil construction costs, and bring it up to $37 million. And that way, the development application will be triggered to be heard in the Northern Regional Planning Panel. It would seem that it's a very deliberate move by NCV Enterprises to actually put themselves over $30 million so that they would be seen, not by the Tweed Shire Council, who is, well, they've got quite, quite um, a history, I suppose you could say, and they would prefer it if the people that they didn't have the history with weren't the ones making the decision. And it's not only just a history, it's actually current too. There is ongoing investigations into illegal activities, illegal earthworks, illegal dwellings. All these sorts of things are currently going on simultaneously with them wanting a development application with multiple documents saying, oh, we will ask for permission before we do any of these things. And yet the whole lands that make up the development are full of illegal structures that have never had development application approval. And they're now, they've, can, they've done illegal earthworks at 3222. Who knows what Dolph Cook's been doing up there on his lot. And, well, Dolph Cook's been having a little bit of trouble today, I hear. Good to hear on the locals in Mandalay Road. Good on you. Now, I'm not going to make this a long one. I'm actually going to finish it up, and I'm actually going to do a couple of short uploads after this. I'm going to re-upload Adrian Brennock's Voxes, the two that have been released previously. These are the ones that kept getting pulled down, and I kept sticking them back up. Well, I've got another little voxer that I think people might be interested in. And it's Adrian Brennock talking about smoke and mirrors when it comes to applying for loans and filling out assets and liability statements. Where you just double it, triple it, quadruple it, you know, make up whatever you want. It's all smoke and mirrors. So I think it's very important to actually let people know 
the kind of people that are actually behind this development, what they are really like. And on that note, I'll let you hear it on the Vox. <laughs> I'll talk to you next time. Bye.